visiting Philadelphia. I am home in Philadelphia. Let me tell you, it's great to be back. It is great to be home. And I can't thank you enough for the warm welcome all of you uh, have laid out for uh, me along with my family. Uh, my, my wife and I, there's my wife here in the front row. Oh, you're going to have to turn this down because I am really loud. Uh, you're going to have to get used to that. Uh, everyone else has. <laughs> So you might want to, I don't know if you got a remote back there, Zach, or something along those lines, but it's getting louder. <laughs> Evidently, I'm not speaking Philadelphia language yet. But my wife, my beautiful wife here in the front, we are excited to be here. Uh, but also who came out to welcome, this is my family, my sister. She said, this is my much, much older sister, Danielle. Stand on up, Dan. Go on, dude. Stand on up. And her son, Donovan, my nephew. And then my beautiful, beautiful wife, who looks about 35 or so. I mean, mother. Sometimes she is my wife. My mother, Beverly, she's here with us as well. <laughs> you, will, uh, you will get to know my mother, I'm sure. <laughs> she, uh, let's just say you think I'm crazy. <laughs> came from. <laughs> my mother, yes, born and raised here, raised us here. Uh, all of my stories, and if you ever listen to me online, most of my, all of my stories are from Philadelphia, uh, so it's great to be back. I gotta tell you, uh, I can't thank you enough for uh, Walter and Kim. Uh, they have been amazing. Uh, they have just poured out themselves since we began this process uh, not too long ago. They have uh, made themselves available. Their hospitality has been over the top. Their friendship has been amazing so far. And Ruby and I can't wait uh, as we begin this new partnership together here in Philadelphia. It, it's been incredible. And, and all of you, uh, I got to tell you, through the interview process, uh, your words of encouragement uh, have been out outstanding. Uh, your, Many of you have a uh, uh, friend, friend requested me on Facebook. Uh, I pretty much accept everything. Da, 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 da. So don't think just because I accept it like, like I know you when I see you. So please don't be offended. <laughs> I'm accepting everybody. If I see you, you got something with Philly, I say, oh, they're from a church because I don't know you and I, they're strangers. And I'm just like, click, 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 click. So uh, please don't send messages. Well, you can send messages through Facebook, but don't expect that that's the means of communication for me because I may look at it once and then not look at it again for two months. You say, but don't you get notifications? Yeah, but I don't look at them. I, no one, I don't communicate through Facebook, okay? So please don't leave a heart rendering message that needs immediate care on Facebook because I probably won't get it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen? Can we get in the Bible this morning? I'm excited about getting in the Bible with you this morning. We're going to be looking at Abraham this morning. Uh, our main text is going to be in Genesis chapter 15. I've entitled this message, I Believe I Am a Part of God's Plan. Write that one down. I believe I am a part of God's plan. You know, if you don't believe that you are a part of God's plan, you, you're feeling it. You know, you may come to church, you may go to Bible study, you may come out on Wednesday night, but if you don't feel like you're a part of God's plan, it's a lonely and dark place. Why? Because you, you come and it seems like God is doing amazing things in everyone else's life but yours. And every time you catch a dream or an ambition, you go for it and then all of a sudden it's thwarted. It doesn't come to fruition and how are you left? Discouraged. And then you look at someone else and they're living a very unrighteous life. They're not even a Christian. And it seems like God is blessing them over and over and over and here you come with your humpty dumpty self on your big wheel that's falling apart and God ain't blessing you. And you got and then you look around at some new Christian that comes in and they got tears of joy over the kingdom of God. You go, oh yeah, that's great. Yeah, you gonna see. You follow what I'm saying here? It just seems like sometimes if because if you're not 
connected or believe that you are a part of God's plan, you're going to feel it. You know, Abraham was a part of God's plan. He believed it, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And if you're Abraham, you're feeling pretty fired up that you are a part of God's plan. Why? Some unknown God, who you don't even know his name, starts speaking to you in visions and dreams and verbally and telling you great things about you and your many, many, many descendants. You are flat fired up. But a lot of times as a Christian, you can kind of feel like, well, that was Abraham. That, that's not me. That's not true. For the Bible says, but you are a chosen people. Does it not say that? That you are chosen. That you are a royal priesthood. Not just a priesthood, a royal priesthood. A holy nation, God's special possession. That you may want to declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into this wonderful light. You are a holy nation set apart by God. You are individually chosen to be a part of God's incredible kingdom. You are a special vessel. A special part of God's glorious, magnificent plan. Everyone is essential. There's not one of us who has been chosen that is not special. But you know, sometimes when we look out, what, what do you see when you look in the mirror and you see yourself? What do you see? You know, we've been chosen by God to declare the praises of Him who called us out of darkness into this wonderful light. In other words, that there was a lifestyle we had that was not light. It was dark. There was an incredible darkness that God called us out of. We were imprisoned in a lifestyle that was not inspiring. And God called us out of it and brought us into a wonderful light. And he said, this was such a magnificent transition that I want you to declare those praises. Why? Because so many live in darkness. So many live lost, empty lives. And they don't see hope. That's why when you talk to them about God or church, they go, I'm all set. I'm not interested. Get away from me. Why? It's a hopeless thought for them. And the only hope they have is a self-reliant life. And you know where that is? You know, last time I preached here, uh, I spoke about a guy who stole my radio. Remember that? Yeah. Chuck stole my radio. <laughs> You know, I traded my skateboard for his radio for a time, and he, or I traded my radio he, for his skateboard, and then Chuck moved away. Well, Chuck came back to Philadelphia. After I preached that message, a buddy of mine by the name of Jason found me on Facebook, and uh, I saw something on his page that said, rest in peace, Chuck. And I go, what? And I look it up. Chuck took his life. Shortly after I preached that message here in Philadelphia, two, three weeks later, Chuck took his life. The sad part about it is not just that he took his life, but how he did it. You know, Chuck grew up with a single mom. His father was never around. But didn't he knew his father because Chuck went to the cemetery and his father's grave and took his life. Two to three weeks after I preached that message here in Philadelphia took his life. Many don't know the reason. He's found a couple of people that knew him, watched the video here, but no one really knew why. But I tell you, lives are being crushed right in our midst. When you look at what do you see? You see, we're chosen people to declare the praises of what God has done in my life to others so that they may have this same opportunity. What do you see? When you look out, what do you see in the lives that are around you? Those lives are God's children. You know, as a parent, one of the more challenging things that you can face is watching your child's life.
fall apart. When you know that there's hope and there's a better way, when there's great victories and ambitions that they could go after and achieve, and, and you see their life fall apart. You see one episode after the next, one chapter after the next, one page after the next, it gets worse and worse, and then they're left with nothing. What it does to a parent's heart, what does it do to God's heart when he walks around the streets of Philadelphia? What does it do to God's heart when he looks at his children whom Satan is retapping upon their lives? What does it do to our father as he thinks about his kids that have suffered greatly? You know, the question is, do we care? Do we care? As fellow brothers and sisters, do we care? You know, when something happens to the family, you, you step up, right? You step up to the plate. You don't want anything happening to one of your siblings. Are you with me on that? You know, if, you, if somebody picks on my sister, I got a problem with that. Unless I pick on her. You know, when I was, when I was a child, I, I picked on my sister. I hit my sister. I know, it's, it's unbelievable. <laughs> you may even withdraw hiring me because of that. I understand that. I would understand that. I picked on my sister. I hit my sister. Now, if I'm supposed to protect my sister and I hit my sister, who's going to protect my sister? My mama. No, mom didn't need dad. Mama found out that I hit Danielle. So mama said, Danielle, come here. Danielle came on over. She goes, you pull that fist up. You pull that other fist up. She grabbed her wrist and told me to come on in. I'm like, what's going on? I ain't do nothing. My mother started jabbing like Ali. Pow, 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 pow. With my sister's hands. Boom, 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 boom. They were tearing me up. I was like, where the punches are coming from? I started running around the house. My mother was a track runner in her early days, I'm sure. She walked me down, dragging. Gotta go to daddy. Dad wasn't home. He was at work. I called him. I got on the phone. Pow, pow, pow. Dad! Dad! And he's like, what? What? They're killing me. They're killing me. He's yelling on the phone. What's going on? My mother's like, pow, 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 pow. She did the shuffle. Boom, 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 boom. Body blow. Boom, 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 boom. Boom. That's when you had the long stringy cord. You follow what I'm saying? You respond. You deal with it. When we go out, we are amongst God's family of people. They may be lost, but they are God's children. And there's some of them are in some horrible life situations. And God has called us out of darkness in this wonderful light that we may declare to them the praises of their Father that they may be reconciled to God. Are you with me on that church? Do we care? See, we've been chosen to care. And I believe I'm a part of God's plan. Well, how does that work? Genesis chapter 15. Come on, bro. You get in there and verse 1. Watch God. It says, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abel in a vision. Do not be afraid. I am your shield, and I am your very great reward. I mean, you understand that we too have been chosen just like Abraham. We are a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people belonging to God. And God says, guess what? Do not be afraid. Why? He says, I am your shield. Not only that, I'm your very great reward. God says, I'm your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer, 
of Damascus. I mean, isn't that something? God says, hey, I am your shield. I'm your protector. Well, nothing, nothing will harm you. And then he turns around and says, I'm your very great reward. You know, God says that to us, but then we go, but, but you know, God, since you mentioned that, I, evidently you don't know that I'm missing out on something right here. And I was wondering if you could hook a brother up. <laughs> you, you follow what I'm saying there? I mean, you know, here's Abraham. He goes, you know, well, well Lord, I'm sorry, Lord. We, well, what can you give me since I don't have a child? What can you give me? You know, there's always something we're yearning. No matter where we're at in life, no matter how blessed we are, there's always something else that we're yearning. Well, you're in good company with Abraham. He says, I'm childless. And not only that, a servant is going to gain my inheritance. And Abraham said, you have given me no child. Whose fault is it? You have, you have given me no child, Lord. So a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord and he credited to him as righteousness. You know, a lot of times we need to just get outside and look to the heavens. God grabbed him and said, let me tell you something. Baby. Get on outside. Get outside of that tent. Get outside of your world and look at what I have created. He said, look to the sky. Count the stars if you can even count them. Let me tell you something. Baby. You may not have one child, but your children will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. Do you believe me, Abraham? And Abraham, the Bible says that Abraham believed. This is where we get the Hebrew word, amen. It literally meant, yes, I am certain of it. And God said, you've done your part. The rest is up to me. You've done your part. What was his part? To simply believe. To simply believe believe to affirm that God was right. And the Bible says that Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. What does that mean? Conformity to a certain set of expectations. He had conformed to the relational expectations. God says, what I need from you is not your strength. Not your wisdom, not your insight. I'm not looking for advice from you. This is what I need you to do, is believe. Trust in me. Confirm that I am God Almighty. And I will do the rest. And then he says, not only am I going to credit to you that as righteousness. You fulfilled this relationship. You have fulfilled the obligation between you and me. Let me do the work. The battle is not yours, says the Lord. You want to transform Philadelphia? Believe. You want to see Philadelphia be a new city? You want to see this county be transformed? You want this room abundantly overfilled? Just believe God. God will make it happen. Do you believe? See, for a lot of us, we have broken dreams. We don't believe. We just show on up. Scepter pulls up, you get on the bus, you get off. You just ride up and down Broad Street all day long on the scene. Don't know what else to do. You're showing up. Well, the bus is coming, I'm getting on. Church starts at 10.30, I'll be there. Then you leave. You don't believe. And when you don't believe, it's not credited to his righteousness. Therefore, the stars do not shine in your life. God is not asking you to go do the work. He's already done the work. Jesus said to the disciples, others have done the hard work. You're reaping the benefit. Just believe. The harvest is plentiful, says the Lord. Do you believe? God wants more people to be saved than you can imagine. God wants to work more miracles than you can even dream up. 
God doesn't need your dreams. He knows exactly what he wants. He's got a plan. He's got a goal. You simply have to believe. Do you believe? For many of us, it's like, no, nah, not really. That's why I'm here. Verse 7. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of her of the Chaldeans to give you this land and to take possession of it. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? See that? He's just like us. We always like, well, what do you mean? Well, I got no child. I got no job. I got no retirement. I got no money. I got no place to live. Could you hook me up, Lord? <laughs> the Lord says, oh, I'm going to take care of that. Then God says, well, not only that, now I'm going to give you a child, but I'm going to give you all this land to possess it. Well, Lord, how, how do I know for sure? I just told you what I was going to do, but how do I know for sure? Like, you, you know, no. As if God's going to tell somebody else that it's more believable than God, right? He said, I just need to know. So the Lord said to him, bring me a heifer. A goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Well, what is a heifer? Well, it's a cow, a female cow, that has not given birth yet. The symbolism in here is beautiful. It's off the chart. It's off the chart. You know, so he's got no child, right? <laughs> So now he's got a three-year-old, right, with no child. He's got to sacrifice that, right? You, you follow what I'm saying there? Then the second one is, is a goat, you know? A goat, you know, it, it's, it's an interesting animal because it can live out in the desert off of desert vegetarian, it, it, you know, wandering in the desert. Then, then the last one is the ram, right? The ram is pretty cool because when Abraham went to sacrifice his child, right before he took the, the child's life, what was stuck with its horns? It was a ram. So many scholars that read this, they say these things represent three different things. Faith, hope, and love. They, they kind of believe that the first one is faith because God began his mission to mankind through Abraham through what? Faith. The latter is hope through what? Moses. Moses brought the law. They all hope for the coming of the promised land to find that rest. And the last one is the ram, right? This one is love. What? It's an exchange for the sacrifice. Jesus Christ comes grace. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is what? Love. You follow what I'm saying here? It's, it's powerful what God is doing to Abraham. He's got no clue. Just like you and I. All he's thinking is, I'm going to wrestle down this goat. You know, God has put blessings all over our lives, and we're just wrestling with the goat. You follow what I'm saying here? The Bible says when he goes to make the sacrifice, there come some birds to eat up the carcass. Every time we're trying to live a sacrificial life, somebody's trying to mess it on up. They're trying to stop and thwart the sacrifices we want to put before God. You follow what I'm saying? Faith, hope, and love. Some would say faith, obedience, and grace. See, it began with faith in Abraham. Through Moses, obedience through the law, through Jesus Christ, grace. God was giving him a full picture of what he was going to do for all of mankind. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. You see, Jesus saw that God's children here on earth were suffering, and he cared. He loved and gave his life. That what? we may live just like Isaac lived because the goat was sacrificed in his place. Jesus allows us to live because he took on the sacrifice, the death that we deserve. Faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Now you look at Abraham, he's of the promise, right? And you go, yeah, we're just like Abraham. Yeah, God chose me. It's like you got a new suit. Feeling sharp. You know, sometimes you got to let the pants out a little bit sometimes. But once you let them out, you feel, feel good. You know, you get new shoes, socks, t-shirt, everything's crisp. You're like, I'm like Abraham. Wow. Are we really like Abraham? 
let's look at Abraham's life. Well, first thing we know, God tells him to leave his homeland and go to a strange land where he knows nobody. But he's the chosen one. Wait, so you want me to go where? Move away from my family? I don't know anyone. Go to a strange land? Just go? Yeah. Immediately when he got to the promised land, what happened? He encountered a famine. But he's the chosen one. Wait, he's the chosen one. God calls him to go to a strange land, leave his family. When he gets there, there's a great famine. Not only that, the Egyptians loved his wife. She's fine, just like Ruby. <laughs> and they snatched Ruby up and took it to the Pharaoh. And I'm sitting there going, nah, she ain't my wife. She's my cousin, my sister on the other side, you know. <laughs> I'm the chosen one. You gonna take my wife? How you gonna take her? And I'm sitting there, ain't doing nothing. Abraham was a little bit of a pawn. <laughs> Can you say that in church? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'd have been the same way. Pharaoh got a big stick, you know. I mean, he's the chosen one, and what happens? Pharaoh takes his place. He's like, God, come on, man. We're, what? What's going on? Not only that, he faced incredible battles. Four and five different kings at one time. Then he, he, can't, he doesn't have his child. He's, Frustrated. His wife is obviously frustrated with him because he's beating his head going, man, I ain't getting this promise. God told me it was coming. I'm a hundred. Look at you. Your, your womb, as the Bible says, is good as dead. You say that to your wife, you're going to have some problems. <laughs> How are you going to say that? And so she's frustrated. And what does she do? She gets vindictive. Well, go sleep with Hagar. You can have her. And the dummy goes and does it. He's like, all right, this whole promise thing is cool. He sleeps with her, then his wife gets ticked off, rightfully so. You got to get her and the kid out of here. <laughs> his marriage is a mess. He's got no children. He's got this one child that's born. His wife wants all of them out of the house. He goes to God and says, God, what do I do? And God says, yeah, send them off. What? <laughs> send them off to the desert so the one son he does have by his bloodline, God is sending out to the desert. And this is the promise God. See, we don't, we don't read our Bible enough to understand that with promise comes great challenge. With being chosen comes great adversity. And when the adversity comes, God has not not chosen you. You are the chosen one. You must endure it. Why? So that when you get out of this mess, you can declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Amen, church? Yeah. Then he finally has a son. And then God says, go kill him. <laughs> and I know what he's thinking the whole time he's going to the mountain. He's like, how am I going to explain this one to Sarah now? I mean, <laughs> you know, we're going to go through a lot. Transition, you know, transition is always cool because there's a lot of grace. But at some point that ends. But I'm hoping it's a good 10 year transition period for my sake. <laughs> and maybe yours too. But you know, we're going to go through a lot. You want to change this world? I want to change this city. I have not come back to Philadelphia just to be home. I have not come back here to get the food and chicken peach, which I love. I have not come here for that. I've come here understanding God has called me and my family to be here in Philadelphia to transform this city. I am bent on changing the world right from here. I'm bent on it. You know, I told my wife, I said, honey, you know, if we go down there at our age, this may be the last chapter. You know, before we retire and y'all send us off to India, which scares the living daylights out of me. I can y'all be with Bermuda or Hawaii or some of those other awesome, awesome places that have lost souls that need God Almighty. On India, we might have to restructure that. I want to go to Paris, London, Spain, Portugal. I'll go to Portugal, Jamaica, Bermuda, Hawaii, any of those places. India, woo! 70 year old man in India, I'm done. I'll step off that train and he'll be like, Ooh, Let me get back to my message. I believe. I believe. 
But I tell you, we're going to go through it. You know, do you have the faith? You know, Abraham never backed down. He had to watch a whole city destroyed. His nephew kidnapped, his wife kidnapped again. He went through it to attain God's dream for his life. How about you and I? Are we willing? We're willing to have the faith to go through it. You know, I look at the last 30 years of my life in Massachusetts and I've learned, you know, just a few things. The one thing that really stands out is in Psalms chapter 20. In Psalms chapter 20, in verse 1, it says, May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. You know, Psalms 20 is penned by David, King David. But it's an interesting writing because he's, he's writing it, but it's not necessarily from him. It's actually from the folks that he's leading. They have come to him. And the Holy Spirit inspired David to write what the Spirit had placed on their heart. And so they're coming to David, and here's what they're saying. May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. And David related to what the Spirit had placed on the people. Therefore, he wrote it here in Psalms chapter 20. He says, you know, may the Lord answer you when you are what? Distressed. May the name of the God of Jacob do what? Protect you. David identified with being stressed. He identified with needing protection. There are a few things we've got to understand as a group, as a fellowship, as a community of believers in Christ. One, I believe we are in this together. You have got to believe that we are in this together. No matter where we come from, no matter what perspective we have on life, family, you name it. We are in this together. You see, the people came to David and said, David, we're praying for you. We are in this thing with you, David. And our prayer is a simple one. May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. You know, when family comes together to the father or to the parents, things happen. A couple weeks ago, my, you know, we've been in transition for a couple of months. We've been sleeping on other folks' beds and pillows. We, we're living in our, out of our luggage. And, and that's fine. It's a good shakeup for the family. My, my kids are like, when are we going to have our own home? We've had two, three different homes in the last three months. Uh, the one we were living in, then we moved to another family's home. Now we're in another family's home, which we're very appreciative of. And each of them is a little weird because my son says, oh, I'm going back home. And I'm like, home where? Like Braintree Home in Boston? Or, you know, it, so we're moving a lot. And so, but in the midst of that, we had some family drama. We had family drama. I had renters drama. I have a, we have a condo that we rent back out in Boston that we sold, praise God. But as soon as we sold it, my tenants came home drunk and kicked the door down. And it wasn't because they were mad I sold it. They just came home drunk, didn't realize they had locked the deadbolt, and thought the door was stuck. And so they decided to knock it down like they were cops. And it was funny. I could see, looking at the door. And I got the inspection happening the day after they knocked the door down. I'm like, ah! So I'm down and before the inspector gets in. Trying to tape up the door with some scotch tape. <laughs> fix it up a little bit, you know what I'm saying? So, I'm trying to fix the door. I'm getting the door fixed. I get outside. My wife calls. She goes, are you down in Cambridge? Yes, honey. We need to talk. Oh, you know when the wife says we need to talk? Something's going on. I'm like, I ain't been home, so I couldn't have done anything, so it ain't me. I'm like, the kids. <sighs> We're on speaker, all of us are here, Camry and Alonzo. Then my wife begins to pour out her heart and all the things that she's feeling and going through and da da da, da. And then, then Camry, Camry's always the first one to step up to the plate. And she starts sharing what she's doing. And she's 12, she knows it's all over the place. Then Alonzo shares, she goes, the truth of the matter, uh, I just woke up and I don't know what's going on and, you know, yeah, whatever. Uh, I can do 
grab her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can we end? <laughs> He's the diplomat of the family. <laughs> and so I'm sitting there. So what happened? The family has come together to go to dad. Why? To fix something. And dad knows. If I don't fix this, I can't go home. You go, wait a minute. Ruby won't let you know. She'll let me in, but Ruby won't be happy. Look, my kids, I got them for another five, six years. Then they're gone. Ruby, we're going to the grave. You, you understand what I'm saying? Mama's got to be happy. Mama has got to be happy. And I got to figure this thing on out. You know, because Mama's feeling it. Now, so I'm, I'm, I'm like, okay, you've all spoken. Here's where Dad is. Then I go, and I'm in the car. You know, I'm looking for the inspector. <laughs> so I'm working things out. Why? Well, when we go to God as a family, God is all ears. When his children come to him, we got a problem, Father. God is going to fix it. He is going to be attentive. That's why I believe we're all in this thing together. We are all in this together. You know, prayer transforms lives. When we come together in prayer for one another, it changes everything. We get the full attention of God Almighty to take care of his family. God loves his family. He will do anything for our benefit. You follow what I'm saying on that church? So they say, may the Lord answer you when you are distressed. Verse 2, may he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. I believe God answers in my distress. You know, we're chosen, but as Abraham had great distress in his life, so will we. There's going to be great stress. What is distress? Extreme anxiety, <laughs> sorrow, great pain. You know, our region, that we're coming from. In the last five years, we've probably had anywhere from know, 10 to 15 deaths. The vast majority of them hadn't even gotten out of their 50s. Very challenging, very <coughs> difficult situations. We had one, we had one young teen who eight years ago lost his dad to cancer. And then now a year ago lost his mom to cancer. So what does that do to a teenager who's not a disciple, who's lost both of his parents, who are both faithful disciples who love God with their whole heart? What kind of message could Satan use against this team? Well, this team was then adopted by uh, a family in the church to be brought into his family. It's transforming his life. But you talk about the challenge and the difficulty of going through that as a young man. And as a congregation coming together, as the church is stressed, going to God, asking God to transform this situation, God is moving. we got to understand that God answers us in our great trouble and distress. We've got to come to the aid of each other. You know, a lot of times these problems come and you think that, Something's wrong with you. <clears throat> Most of the time it's not. It's par for the course. But it's our faith. It is our faith in God that transforms them. Verse 3. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. You know, you, we give a lot. <laughs> we sacrifice a lot, right? And, and, and the people are going, you know, we, 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 we recognize what you're doing here, David. We recognize these sacrifices. Don't, don't limit yourself. Don't think God has forgotten what you've done for him. Don't think God is oblivious to your giving, to your sacrifice. But, you know, in the midst of believing, we must have great sacrifice. We've got to believe in sacrifice. Several years ago, uh, Christmas rolls around, and for me, Christmas is a time to veg, to chill, to relax, to shut down, to breathe, to do nothing. After the presents are over, I'm done, man. I'm going to sleep. It's over, you know? I got my devotional thought every Christmas morning with the kids. It's all about gratitude. It's not about the gifts. You know, the same old story, right? <laughs> Jesus is the greatest gift we'll ever receive. Be happy what you got. 
No, so I'm taking it all back, right? Oh, I'm sorry. That's not really the message, but you, you follow what I'm saying? And we have this particular sister who says, oh, I want to come over to your house over the holiday. Sure, come on over. No, Christmas morning. Christmas morning? Whoa, sis, like, wow. So don't ask. You can ask. And now this sister was blind. Family wasn't around. Lived in a, a home, it was a shutter. You couldn't come out to services. Uh, because of her, her heavy weight, had a very difficult time walking. Very difficult. Couldn't even really walk. I mean, it was... And she said, I want to come over and spend it with you guys. I'm like, the whole day? <laughs> now, mind you, I'm doing a devotional on Christmas is about giving. <laughs> it's not about what you get, it's what you get to give. And it's about gratitude, it's about blessings. Now, how am I going to do that? And tell this sister, no, you can't come over because I need to rest. <laughs> so I said, no, nah, come on over. I had to call another brother just to get her. We only had two steps that went into our place, but I needed help to literally hoist her on the two steps. Now, she can't see either. And to walk her on in, and, and then we sat down, and she spent the day with us. And eating, you know, you don't realize, you know, without sight, knowing where things are. She wanted us to describe where they were. And, wiping her mouth and just helping. I mean, it was, it was an outpouring from my heart. It transformed my heart. You know, because she's God's daughter. She, I mean, it's like it's Christ's sister. And that's why Jesus says, if you've done any of these to the least of one of them, you've done it for me. He really meant that. And it's so easy to dismiss. I don't know about you, but for me, it's easy to dismiss. No, no, look at them. They, they, they got a lot of work going on. They, I, that's work. I'm, I'm looking to chill. Who, who's the fun giver that can come hang with you? That's my natural tendency. Maybe y'all not like that. I'm sorry. Y'all hired the wrong dude. <laughs> Please forgive the Evanses. <laughs> that temptation. You don't want to, you know, there are moments to give, right? I'm going to give here. But all the time, all any moment, when God decides it's time to give, you follow what I'm saying? God says now. And I'm like, right now, Lord? like I'm a kid playing a video game. My mom says, come on and eat. No, I'm in the middle of the game. I'm killing enemies. Now, now. God will call on me to serve. We got to be willing to do that. Especially when it comes to studying the Bible with folks, right? Reaching out to people. Opening our mouths again and again and again and again. Even when people say, no, get out of here. I've heard that. I don't want to come to your church. You meet where? When? Who? I don't know y'all. <laughs> We've got to be willing to sacrifice. I believe our victories are our victories. Our victories, they truly are ours. I believe that. I believe that the victories that God blesses our congregation with are ours together. Because we're praying for each other, we're there for each other, we're supporting each other, we're great friends. You know, it's always awesome to pick up the phone and call a friend and get an input. You know, when we were having that little family drama, you know, I didn't fix all of it, at least I thought I did. And then uh, Dan and Julie happened to be driving up to New England for a little bit of a getaway. And Julie texts Ruby, oh, so excited, you guys are coming. Ruby goes, oh, can we talk? You know, when the wife calls somebody and you ain't there, you, you don't get... You don't get to give your part. You understand what I'm saying? Only the brothers understand me at this moment. She called me later. My wife called me later. She goes, I got to talk to Julie about everything. What? What? what whoa, whoa. What Julie say? Oh, here's what Dan said. Yeah, Dan. Come on, Dan. My man. He became my man at that moment. <laughs> but it's great to connect with people. We're in this thing together. Dan and Julie have played such a vital part in our lives since our kids were newborns. Uh, we've been with them at different stages of our life, some of the most critical stages of our life. It's great to have people like that in our life. We all need that. We all need that support and help to be reminded that our victories are our victories. And my final thing is, I believe we must trust in the Lord. I believe we must trust in the Lord. In verse 6 it says, 
Now this I know. The Lord gives victory to his anointed. He answers him from the heavenly sanctuary with the victorious power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots, some in horses. But we, Philadelphia Church of Christ, trust in the name of our Lord, our God. We trust in the name of the Lord. We don't put trust in people or situations or finances. We trust in God. What does that mean? That God is sovereign over the land. That God is always here protecting and guiding and shepherding his people. God is at our side. God is with us. That's where we trust. Therefore, you know what? We can dream. We can dream. You know, there's a sister in uh, the Boston church several weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago. She was on the phone with her mom who lives in Kenya. And she was talking to her mom about just life and what she's doing, things of that nature. And her mom happened to mention about a little girl who lived near, near them. And when she was about two or three years old, she was caught in a fire that, that broke out in the home. And the fire burned massive amounts of her body uh, when she was two or three. And when it, when it did that, it killed the skin. And so now she's 16. And because the skin would no longer have died, it doesn't stretch. So as she grew, she was not able to stand up because the skin is tight, you know, like bark. And so she's hunched over and unable to stand up. So you know she can't do anything, tough school, things of that nature. And her mom was sharing that with her. And she was just, you know, moved, just crushed that something could happen to such a small child. And it just devastated her. Well, a couple days later, she happened to be in her small group that she meets with where they have Bible school discussions. And there was a new brother who had just moved in to their group. He happened to be a doctor. And he just in casual fellowship, they're talking, how's it going? And she said, oh, things are great. You know, I was talking to my mom. She says, oh, this tragic story. This little girl really crushed my heart. And I just feel it. And, and the doctor said, now, what happened? And so she explained she was caught in a fire. She goes, you know, I'm really good friends with the number one surgeon here in Boston with burn victims. Let me, let me tell him about this story and see what he says. Well, he goes, tells a story to this guy. And the doctor goes, you know what, I want to see pictures of the girl. They got pictures to him. He says, I'll tell you what, I'm going, to take, I'm going to take care of this little girl. You get her here to Boston, and I will, I will take care of all of her uh, medical needs. I will do all the surgeries. Many surgeries are lined up. You just get her here, and I'll take care of her. Well, this brother happened to know another sister that was a part of a group, the Shriners, burn victim, who knew some other people and shared the story with them. Shriners said, we'll pay for everything to get her over here. Not only will we pay for everything, we'll pay for her to have a sponsor, someone over there from her town to come with her because she's going to have to live here in Boston for all the surgeries. Well, they do that. They get the little girl here. She's had her first surgery already. She's beginning to stand up. They're, she's in an incredible pain. And a week ago, they celebrated her 16th birthday, the first time she's ever had a birthday celebration. Their disciples all around this little girl as she's being transformed. Why? Because one sister decided to dream. Dream. She didn't trust in people, but in God. And God had orchestrated all this, so the little girl is now living. Another disciple in the downtown region decided they're going to move that family in. So after the surgeries, when they have to go to a home, they're going to move them into their home and take care of them. But she has to go back for multiple surgeries. Imagine what the parent is feeling back home. I mean, just blown away that her daughter can stand up. Not only that she can stand up, they're doing a party for her. People are taking care of her. It's costing her not one dime. And she's going to say, who are these people? Those that have been called out of darkness into this wonderful light. That we may declare the praises of God. Amen, church? Let's be the vessel that God has called us to be. Thank you, and I'm fired up to be a 